concludes. I've got a question for Dr. Craig. When Jesus faced death on the cross, according to Christian belief, did he face it with the human belief that he would be raised on the third day? Or did he face it with the infallible knowledge that he would be so raised? If he believed with human faith in God's power to raise him, then he himself was not God. But if, on the other hand, he faced death with the infallible divine knowledge that he would be resurrected, then he was not taking any real risk in letting himself die. Because if the divine nature in him knew he would be raised, but Jesus did not know that, then it was not his divine nature. If the divine nature knew something he did not, then we are back to two persons. So explain that to me. To say someone is both perfect and imperfect at the same time is to say that X and not X can both be true. And that's to obviously abandon logic. Let's look at this, the story of the fig tree. <coughs> Jesus was hungry. Seeing in a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went out to find if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one eat fruit from you again. Now, the problem I've got with this is that it's easy to understand that the human Jesus felt hunger and that the human Jesus did not know it was fig season and so mistakenly expected the tree to have fruit. A divine Jesus would have known all of this. Now his miracles, or the cursing of the tree, they say, are performed by his divine nature. Okay, so let's assume that the divine Jesus cursed the tree. But why? Why ruin a tree which in Mark's view was a perfectly good tree? Come fig season, the tree would have fruit and others would have eaten from it. The reason was that the human Jesus made a mistake. But why did the divine Jesus act upon the mistake of the human Jesus? Why does the divine Jesus act upon the mistake of the human Jesus? Does the human mind in Jesus guide the divine nature in him? Actually, there's no warrant for all the speculation, for scripture nowhere says that Jesus has two natures. Some will say that everything is possible with God and that we are using words here with their meanings. That's true. Everything is possible. But if you tell me God did such and such a thing, that's fine. But you cannot say that God did and God did not. He is and he is not. Jesus is all-knowing and he is not all-knowing. Jesus is all-seeing and he is not all-seeing. Therefore, I would say impossible. C. Randolph Ross concludes. He's, so the question is this, is that it, uh, Randolph Ross c uh, continues on this particular point, that if you want to wish to redefine some words, that's fine, as long as you can tell us the new meanings. The usual practice, however, seems to be to say that while one cannot say precisely what these new meanings are, one is nevertheless sure they fit together in a way that makes sense. That's simply an effort to duck the requirements of logic. Are you basically saying Jesus is X? And Jesus is why, X and Y being two unknowns, that's basically to say nothing at all. This is an individual called William Ellery Channing, one of the many Christians who have moved to that scriptural position that Jesus is human. He says, where do you meet in the New Testament the phraseology which abounds in Trinitarian books, in which necessarily grows from the doctrine of the two natures of Jesus. Where does a divine teacher say, this I speak as God and this as a man. This is true of my human mind and this of the divine. Where do we find in the epistles a trace of the strange phraseology? Nowhere. It was not needed in that age. It was demanded by the errors of a later age. This is an interesting figure. This is actually Dr. Craig's doctoral advisor, John Hick. He authored a book with a number of theologians called The Myth of God Incarnate. And in it, what John Hick has come to the conclusion that basically, like many theologians, many practicing theologians, that Jesus himself was just simply a man, a prophet of God. Anyone who still has doubt on this particular matter should read that particular book. And no, he's not a modern-day Hindu, Dr. Craig, as you seem to suggest with Dr. Badawi. Um, he, he is someone of standing, and this book has been co-authored by many other learned theologians. In fact, I, I'm quite interested to know which biblical scholar of note today, um, uh, within one of the major assemblies, in fact, subscribes to the view that uh, Jesus is divine. I put the open challenge, and this is a beautiful church. If you can show me one verse in the New Testament where Jesus says, I am God, or where he says, worship me or in the context of tonight's debate, I am both man and God, 
I'm prepared to be baptized tonight. I don't speak for, for my, for my Christ, uh, Muslim uh, uh, brethren here. I don't speak for any, but I'm saying, show me one particular verse where he says that. Is there any greater than God? Does anyone believe anyone's greater than God? Jesus says, my father is greater than I. In John, my father is greater than all. In Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. God is not a man that he should lie. Is God able to do everything? Yes. Jesus says, of myself I can do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father that sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that bear witness. Another. I mean, if you are saying that his, humanity, his divinity was purely incidental, then why is it he goes out of his way to emphasize his humanity? God knows everything, of course. Jesus says, but of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. I see in the lecture which I will be dealing with in the rebuttal section, Dr. Craig seemed to suggest, that, well, look, Jesus is now placing himself above the angels. But I think you're reading into scripture. But besides that, in the Quran, we are even told that man is placed on a higher level above the angels. Why? Because he basically has that choice of free will, which angels don't have. So man is seen as higher than angels. So in other words, if you were to agree with that, Dr. Craig, then you'd simply be confirming the Islamic belief. God speaks from himself. Jesus, please. Jesus says, whatsoever I've heard, these things do I speak. The words you have heard are not mine, but the Father that sent me. He had given me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak, even as the Father himself so I said I speak. Does God pray? Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he fell on his face, just like a Muslim would do. In Matthew 26, 39. Please, please, please. Thank you, thank you. Give me another definition of the prophet in Acts 2.22. Dear men of Israel, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God, among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. A man approved of Jesus identified as a prophet. It's not necessarily an Islamic belief. It's a biblical belief. That's what the New Testament says. I must walk today and tomorrow, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of, Israel, out of Jerusalem. A prophet perish outside of Jerusalem? Jesus saying that? What's the belief where Jesus was killed? Where was he killed? Outside Jerusalem? He says here, a prophet cannot perish outside of Jerusalem. No man has seen God at any time. You cannot see his shape or hear his voice. So when he told Philip, he was seen me as seen the Father, he must have been meaning something else. Now... The idea that Jesus is the Son of God is an idea which basically is a later development. James Dunn, who is a contemporary of Dr. Craig, in his book Evidence for the Messiah, he states that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, statistically, one can determine that there is an evolution in terms of what Jesus said and how is he viewed. For example, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus speaks about the kingdom of God 47 times and hardly of himself. But in John's Gospel, he speaks about the kingdom of God only five times. In Mark, Mark Jesus speaks about himself like I am this or I am that nine times. But in John's gospel, he speaks about himself a whopping 118 times. When we realize that Mark was the first gospel and John was the last, we can see then that the development in the way Jesus was represented over time. For example, in Mark's gospel, Jesus refers to God as the Father once. But in John's gospel, he refers to God as the Father 73 times. In Mark's gospel, he refers to Je Jesus refers to God as Father three times, but in John's gospel, a whopping 100 times. So, whereas in Mark, more about the kingdom of God and less about himself, in John, more about himself and less of the kingdom of God. There's an evolution in terms of what we see, in terms of how Jesus represents himself. So, it seems to me that the high Christology where Jesus represented himself as a son of God is thought to be a later insertion. I mean, Dr. Raymond Brown in his Anchor Bible, uh, Volume 29, and Dr. Paul B. Duff, who is the chair of the Department of Religion at uh, George Washington University, states that the innovated concept of the Son of God, or the begotten Son, developed in the 4th century. Dr. Craig um, believes that Raymond Brown is a scholar of note, and Raymond Brown is certainly a recognized scholar in the world. It was injected by Jerome into the Latin Bible to refute the claims made by Bishop Arius and his associates that Father alone was really God and Jesus was made and not begotten. But it's interesting. This is a letter from Paul P. Duff. And what he says that in John 3.16 and John 1.18, the words which have been translated 
for begotten, um, the actual Greek word is monogamous.